And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. I would like to advise members that questions 3, 6 and 9 have been withdrawn. So I call uh, Mr Danny Kennedy. Question number one, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In response to the significant financial challenges facing my department in the 2014-15 financial year, the Health and Social Care Trust has prepared a range of contingency proposals to help them meet their statutory obligation to deliver <coughs> financial break-even in that year. The measures proposed by trusts were wide-ranging and reflected the measures that could achieve financial savings in the latter part of 2014-15. My department monitored the achievement of the overall break-even position rather than tracking the achievement of each individual contingency plan proposal. It is important to emphasise that overall financial break-even was achieved in 2014-15 and the Trust's contingency proposals played a key role in delivering that outcome. I call Danny Kennedy for a supplement. Thank uh, the Minister for his, uh, his reply thus far and, uh, and he has conceded that the motivating factor behind these decisions was to save costs, with uh, unfortunately patients and service users um, being overlooked and ignored. And these decisions were spun as being temporary, but of course many uh, become permanent. Can the Minister explain how decisions such as the closure of the Minor Injuries Unit in, Ar in Armagh corresponds and complements departmental policies such as Choose Well and seeking to keep people out of emergency departments? I think the, the, member, the member makes a very good point at the outset, which I'll come back to, Deputy Speaker, in, in the more broader context of, of, of the best way to make savings or, or efficiencies. Um, the member will recall, he will recall particularly acutely because he was a member of the executive uh, in 2014-15, and he will remember the acuity of the situation in respect of, of public finances at that time because the issues surrounding uh, welfare reform, not progressing that, the fines that were starting to impact upon what wasn't my department then, but is my department now, what was previously his department, were starting to, to come through. Um, in respect of, of decisions, and, and particularly in respect of Armagh Minor Injuries Unit, uh, the member will know that it was a, a temporary closure. A final decision has not been taken to make that permanent. Um, um, there wasn't, the, the, my understanding from the Trust, and of course these are all decisions that are taken by the Trust, not by the department. Um, in order to live within their, their budget in the financial year um, was based on the fact of many, many pieces of evidence, but not least the fact that the number of people attending that minor injuries unit in Armagh was only four per hour on average. Uh, some of that resource then has been moved to Craig Avon to assist the situation there with their emergency department. In respect of the overall position about whether it's the best way or not to make efficiencies, I'm on the record since becoming Minister that whenever you have a situation where you're making efficiencies or savings on the basis of budgetary pressures, um, it will um, sometimes, even though the decisions are probably in the best interests of the community which we, which we seek to serve, uh, they can give the impression of not being strategic, not being long term. Uh, and that's why I have tried to change the conversation, Mr Deputy Speaker, around trying to take a long term view about the need to reform our services, taking decisions that are in the best interests of the people and the patients that our health and social care system is there to serve, and to give a clear understanding to people as to why a particular decision is being taken, and also why that will produce a better outcome for them, because at the end of the day, it is the patient that is the most important part of our system. I call Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for uh, his answers. Um, everyone knows how tight the health department's budget is and that savings uh, need to be made, and this has also included uh, staff pay. However, could the Minister outline what he intends to do in regards to the HSC staff pay award uh, for 2016-17, um, because a lot of people are waiting uh, on good news in relation to that? Well, hopefully, Deputy Speaker, I will be able to give uh, those who are waiting some good news now. Uh, the Assembly will, will know that I recently announced that I would ask uh, the independent NHS pay review body for a recommendation in respect of a 2016-17 pay award, and I indicated that I would honour their conclusions. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have now received the pay review body's response. In it, they suggest that certain economic factors, particular to Northern Ireland, could point towards the option of a nil award. Uh, and they state that they have seen no evidence to say that large numbers of staff are leaving Northern Ireland because of pay. However, they do recommend a 1% increase for all Agenda for Change staff in Northern Ireland in line with the rest of the United Kingdom. And I am happy to confirm that I am accepting 
their recommendation for a 1% pay award. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this will be challenging in what are tough budgetary times for my department, but I am clear that it is an appropriate award for our hardworking staff, uh, who I'm sure will warmly welcome this decision. I call Karen McKevitt. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister to confirm that there was cross-trust collaboration in these cuts to ensure that uh, cutting a service in one trust was not putting pressure um, on another trust? It, it's worth, uh, obviously trusts um, operate as distinct entities um, and the, the member characterises them as, as, as cuts. Some of the, the, the contingency measures which were um, asked in Mr Kennedy's question were for particular financial year 14-15. Uh, and the total um, value of those uh, contingency measures was around 16 million. Uh, not all of the measures that were suggested by trusts were uh, accepted by the board, for example. Uh, and, and within that 16 million, yes, there were a few which perhaps made the, the headlines and were the ones that people have focused and, and concentrated on. But a lot of what was in there in terms of savings were things that I'm sure that everybody in the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, would agree are good ideas for where we should be trying to seek to save money. So, for example, there are around vacancy controls, uh, there are around reducing overtime, or, uh, reducing the use of, of agency staff. Um, there's also around um, administration, corporate management uh, fees and locum rates and so forth. So a lot of these are areas, um, and also stopping uh, clinical excellence awards. Uh, so a lot of these measures, which are not the ones that perhaps have been the focus of public attention or po political attention, but are actually very good what should be done ordinarily by trusts or by any part of the public sector to reduce costs and to reduce overheads in what is a time whenever we're facing significant budget pressures, particularly as we were facing significant budget pressures at, at that time as uh, welfare reform fines and then losing that $200 million to the executive was really beginning to bite, and particularly bite in, in, in my department. So some of those savings that are, are, are made are, are ones that are, I'm, I'm sure would be welcomed on all sides. Others where they perhaps more have a, a more obvious impact on service delivery are understandably controversial in their nature. And in terms of taking any decisions, I would expect all trusts to take those sorts of decisions and make those recommendations on the basis of the fullness of evidence that they have before them. I call Claire Subden. Uh, question number two. Mr Deputy Speaker, in October last year, I established a, a working group to review the provision of GP-led care and to make recommendations aimed at ensuring the future sustainability of GP services. This working group has been led by my department and its membership includes a patient representative, GP representatives, members of the Health and Social Care Board, Health and Social Care Trust, the Royal College of Nursing, uh, Nursing and the Allied Health Professions Federation. The group has met regularly since its establishment and has considered a wide range of issues including the recruitment and retention of GPs and how best to support the existing GP workforce. The group is currently finalising its report and I expect to receive a copy within the next few days. I will, of course, give careful consideration to its findings and recommendations. I expect the working group's recommendations to build on actions I have already taken to address the challenges GPs face. I recently announced an investment of 1.2 million each year to commission an additional 20 GP training places starting in 2016-17. This is the largest investment in GP training for more than 10 years and will increase the number of GP trainees to 85 per year from August of 2016. In December, I announced a five-year investment initiative that will put close to 300 pharmacists in GP practices by 2021, easing pressures on GPs and ensuring that patients continue to receive a high-quality service. In addition, as part of an investment package of up to 5.1 million in 15-16, new schemes have been introduced aimed at encouraging GPs who have left practice in Northern Ireland to return and supporting the existing GP workforce to remain in practice. These actions are helping to ensure that the people of Northern Ireland continue to have timely access to sustainable, high-quality, GP-led primary care services. I call on Claire uh, Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister's response. Um, I've recently met with uh, doctors from general practice, and they're telling me that they're at a stage where they're at a breaking point because they, they feel that their resources are so uh, tightly squeezed. Um, one of the biggest pressures, actually, um, are GPs maybe taking on responsibilities that have never been theirs before, so maybe uh, interpreting results from consultants or even filling in DLA forms. Could the member come becoming... to a question, please? Yes. So, um, I would like to ask the Minister how does he intend on moving forward after the report in supporting GPs so that their workload isn't as, as significant as it currently is? So some of the issues that the, the member, one in particular that the member has raised is not an, uh, an issue that we are asking them as a department or the board will be asking um, as a system for, for GPs to do. It's a matter for them to uh, take on board themselves. They are, of course, 
And sometimes I think we forget this. They are independent contractors as opposed to people working directly for um, health trusts or, or the board or the department. Uh, and I do accept that they, they are a profession that is under pressure. And the number of consultations, you just have to look at the number of consultations and the increase in the number of consultations from 2008 09, where there was 10.2 million consultations in Northern Ireland. That has risen uh, to 12.7 million in 2013 14, an increase of, of around a quarter. Uh, and clearly, that is going to put some, some pressure on a, on a GP workforce, which is exceptionally good, but is an ageing workforce as well. And, and, and obviously, those pressures aren't helping to keep people and retain people inside the system. I acknowledge the pressures, and that's why there has been a, a, I suppose you could describe it as a package of measures that have been put in place to try to, to deal with the pressures that they're facing. And I have too met with uh, individual GPs, I've met with the Royal College of General Practice, I've met with the British Medical Association as well. Mm -hmm. And on top of the uh, funding package that was put in in April of this financial year, so April last year, uh, of around 10 million for a uh, GP modernization fund, some investment in skills, some investment in the development of GP federations. We have invested the biggest investment in 10 years, as I noted, um, in, in increasing GP training places to particularly deal with that issue of, of GPs leaving and not being able to retain them. Uh, the GP, the working group itself, is a response to a call from from that sector to come forward with long, short, medium, and long-term recommendations. And, and indeed, the, the GP pharmacist initiative, as I mentioned as well, is again something that GPs themselves have called for. So yes, well, there is a problem. We accept it and we acknowledge that there is a problem. But we're not sitting back and doing nothing. We are coming forward with a range of measures, many of which owe their origins to the profession themselves coming and suggesting them to us and the department positively responding to them. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers um, so far. Um, we understand the pressure that GPs are under, and the Minister has already mentioned um, the um, the Pharmacists and GP Practices Initiative. I wonder, could the Minister outline um, some of the benefits involved in that initiative? Uh, this was something that uh, well, I was very pleased to be able to announce uh, towards the tail end of last year. And, I mean, th th this was, a, as I mentioned in response to, to Ms Sugman's uh, question, something which we had been working with our GPs on. They had suggested this as an idea. We had um, piloted a scheme. Uh, and I was then able to go down and, and see one of those um, pilot schemes for myself down in the, the Arches um, practice down in uh, the bottom of the, the Hollywood Road here in Belfast. And what we have been announcing is a, a five-year investment, which will start off quite small, be £2.6 million pounds worth of investment in the next financial year, rising to £14 million pounds of investment by 2020-21. And that will allow us to, over that five years, ramp up the number of pharmacists who will be working in practice so, alongside GP practices. Some of them will be... Uh, full-time in a practice, some of them will be part-time, some sharing between a, a couple of different practices in more rural areas, it might be a day in, in, in practices over a wider uh, geographical area. Uh, and there will be, I suppose there are two benefits, and the member asked for benefits, there are two areas where there are benefits. One is the financial savings, um, where there will be a benefit, so we, we anticipate that by 2021 our investment will be yielding savings of around £16 million, pounds, so the scheme will start, will pay for itself. Uh, but there are also non um, Monetary benefits as well, including better prescribing, so those GPs will be able to do checks on a regular basis of what people are being prescribed and whether it's working for them or not. It will reduce prescribing costs, it will increase capacity in GP surgeries, um, it will remove some of the pressure that we were talking about from GPs, so GPs will be able to use these pharmacists to take away some of the pressure that they are facing, and, and it will hopefully also reduce the number of acute admissions. So there are a range of benefits, whether both monetary and non-monetary, that will, will um, be derived from this. Uh, innovative uh, initiative, which I was very, very pleased to have been able to announce last year. I call Jared Diver. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers to date. And, uh, Minister, despite listening with interest to the range of measures that you're putting in place to help general practice, in my constituency in the West, we are aware of falling numbers of trainees generally coming into general practice, and the scheme is uh, unsubscribed year after year. What effect is this having on the strategic goals for GPs contained within Transforming Your Care, with one GP saying to me only today that falling numbers make the Transforming Your Care plans impossible? I, I, I accept that there are, as I hope I've indicated in response to the answers I've given so far, um, that there are um, pressures and I acknowledge that there is an issue in terms of general practice, and that's why we've been rolling out all of the various initiatives and investments that, that we've been making. I accept that there are some parts of the province where the problem is 
particularly acute compared to, to others. And I'm not saying, for example, that there aren't issues in the Belfast or greater Belfast area, but there is certainly an acuteness of the problem in, in the west of the province. I recently visited, um, not quite the member's constituency, but um, Fermanagh, um, along with the, the First Minister, to hear directly from GPs in that county about the, the difficulties that they're facing. And I accept and acknowledge the problem they're, they're, they're facing because I think that th those, those problems that I've been talking about or responding to, to Ms. Sugden in respect of um, are, are, I think, a little more, more pronounced in that part of Northern Ireland. So the fact that you know, we have a, a GP workforce where over a quarter or around a quarter or over 55 years of age, that does seem to be a much more pronounced problem in Fermanagh, where you have, a, or in the west of the province, and where you have um, many GP practices in the west of the province where there are single or just two doctors in them mm -hmm. or two GPs in them, that, that then add, adds to those pressures that people are, are facing. Uh, and one of the impacts of, of one of the initiatives in terms of the increase, the 1.2 million investment, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in um, more GP training places, the biggest investment of its kind in over a decade, We'll see 20 more GPs go into training, and four of those GP training places will go into the Western Trust area to help to alleviate some of those problems. And obviously, that will be cumulative over the next number of years as, as those numbers um, start to move, move through the system. Obviously, there is an issue with retention, and that's something that I'm, I'm keen to address. And I, and, I, and I imagine, without having seen the response of the working group, I, I would be very surprised if the working group does not contain a recommendation uh, to do something in respect of trying to retain GPs in certain parts of the province, particularly in the west and the northwest. I call Sandra Overend. Question number four, please. Sir, uh, Deputy Speaker, the total amount spent on taxis by my department and its arm's length bodies in 2014-15 was £4,878,261. This covers all taxis, taxi use, including taxis for patients, social care clients and staff. I call Sandra Overend for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the, that, uh, that answer. I'm disappointed that it's taken this question during oral answers to get the information from, from the Minister, as he has repeatedly refused to, to answer written questions. Um, as waiting times remain, ter remain terrifying, the Minister's only response is, is piecemeal funding announcements um, and pre-election pre stunts. Can I ask the Minister, um, uh, despite uh, previously, uh, sorry, can I ask the Minister who's previously, does he agree with previous comments from other DUP members um, that uh, this spending is totally outrageous? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what the question was in, in that. There was, there was several. I'm not even sure the member uh, actually believes what you said in respect of some of the, the comments that you made. Um, I don't want to preempt the question that is next up from. Um, Ms. McCorley in respect of, of waiting times, but you know, I, I think the, the member should reflect on slightly churlish comments around pre-election stunts and throwing piecemeal funding at waiting lists. This is a, a, a serious issue. There are many, too many people waiting for operations, procedures, tests in Northern Ireland, and I'm sure that uh, even if the member can't welcome the investment of a further £30 million pounds in tackling waiting lists, I'm sure many of those who, with the 150,000 people who will benefit from the, the £70 million, pounds, Mr Deputy Speaker, that will be invested this calendar year, uh, will welcome the investment that has been made that will ensure that they get the treatments and procedures and operations that they require. Uh, in respect of, of this issue on, on uh, taxi funding, um, I, mean, I think it's one of those issues that does sometimes come, come to the fore and gets a bit of concentration because it, it seems so very different from what would be core business in a department like mine. It's worth reflecting on the fact that um, the total expenditure of um, under for about 4.8 million um, last year is, is not 0.1 per cent of the total budget. Um, using taxis provides a flexible and reliable service for the system um, and it does supplement our, our own fleet of our transportation fleet. Uh, right across the health and social care system. Uh, um, perhaps a member too would reflect on some of the uses of taxis, and it's, you know, I think perhaps sometimes it gives the impression of people swanning about all over the country using these taxis. These are being used in specific circumstances. There are strict guidelines around when it should be used, and the sort of times that they're used are to provide safe transportation of children in car, um, providing transport for adult mental health outpatients, to take people to and from day centres. To, to take people to and from their renal dialysis and to also to take um, social work staff to ensure that they can escort patients when they're going to hospital. So 
yes, the, it, it, it has an appearance of a large figure. It is not big in the context of the overall budget, up. and it is being well used. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, can the Minister give us an indication of how the expenditure uh, over this recent term in terms of the, the, the use of taxis uh, compares with the expenditure um, during the last Assembly term? Um, I'm very, very happy to, to provide a, um, an update. I wasn't able to find the time to provide it to, to Mrs Overend, um, who was, I think, critical. I um, can't remember what she um, exactly said about the, this level of expenditure on ta taxis, but she was certainly critical. But the interesting point, which a member I'm sure will uh, appreciate, is that the figures are falling and have been falling in, in recent years. And they've been falling from a high of £5.2 million in 2009 2010. So, you know, £4.4 million, £400,000 higher in 2009 2010 than they have been in, in the most recent financial year. And the member will, of course, remember, even if Mrs Overend has forgotten, who was Minister of Health in 2009-2010. It was, of course, in case anybody needs reminding, Michael McGimsey of the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, figures rose during his time in office from £4.5 million to that £5.2 million, and they have been falling down to a reasonably steady level ever since. Deputy Speaker. I call Rosalie McCorley. Cash Dever Coogler to hold question number five, please. Uh, improving waiting uh, times continues to be one of my key priorities, and the vast majority of the additional resources made available by the Executive through November monitoring are going directly towards tackling waiting times. This is expected to benefit around 70,000 patients who would otherwise be waiting for assessments, diagnostics and treatments. I am pleased to say that delivery of this additional activity is progressing well. Most people will be seen during January to March of this year, so the full extent will not become clear until early 2016-17. However, we are now seeing real reductions in the number of people waiting for assessment or treatment. Robust performance management figures are in place, and provisional figures for February, uh, show that, February of this year show that those waiting more than 18 weeks for an outpatient appointment have fallen by 6 per cent, and those waiting longer than 26 weeks for an inpatient day case has fallen by 13 per cent. It is clear that the investments we are directing towards waiting lists are making a difference. Slowly but surely, we are getting to grips with our waiting lists. On Sunday, I announced the allocation of £30 million of additional funding to continue tackling waiting lists. This additional funding will support up to 25,000 additional assessments and some 12,000 additional treatments across, our, across a wide range of specialities, including orthopaedics, gastroenterology, neurology and ENT. Importantly, it will see a £10 million investment in diagnostic services, building capacity to support up to 50,000 additional tests to help meet increasing demands, as well as supporting seven-day services. This further £30 million shows, uh, follows the Executive's early al earlier allocation of the £40 million, and the combined £70 million will ensure in the region of 150,000 extra assessments, tests and procedures. Also, many children awaiting assessments for autism will benefit from the £2 million I recently allocated for this specific area. It is clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it will take some time and significant non-recurrent and, non and recurrent investment to bring waiting lists back to acceptable levels while simultaneously increasing capacity to meet increasing demand. My commitment to an additional £30 million is an important step, important step to ensuring continued progress. I call Rosalie McCorley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And it was a, it was a very comprehensive answer, and I thank the Minister for that. And uh, the, the statistics are, are encouraging that uh, things are moving in the right direction. But as we know, this there's a, there's a recurrent growing problem here. So, how confident would 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 the minister be that? waiting lists will continue to decrease and we will get seriously to grips with this problem. Well, part, part of the, the member is right that there, there is, we, can, we can invest and we are investing. And I think we should um, note and welcome the, the additional investment that I have um, announced um, in the last number of days on top of the £40 million that is going in, in this year. Uh, and that is, of course, sometimes I think maybe Deputy Speaker, people think that that's the only money that's going towards addressing waiting lists. This is on top of the what might be described as the ordinary activity by our trust, which ensures that um, around 600,000 inpatient cases, day cases, go on a year, and around 1.5 million uh, outpatient uh, consultant-led uh, appointments take place as well. So this is additional on top of that. Uh, and the members are right to identify that there are, even when you remove somebody, there is 
somebody coming in at the other end of, a, of a, a waiting list. And sometimes people move from one waiting list to another waiting list. So they move from an outpatient one to an inpatient one or a, via, say, a diagnostic one as well. Um, so there's a constant churn and, of, of people coming out at one end of the list and people coming on at the other end. And that's reflected in the fact there's been a 14% increase in the number of referrals. So never mind any issues with finance, and they are pertinent issues, but there has been a 14% increase in the number of people being referred by their GPs or others to uh, go to hospital for, for outpatient and other appointments. Uh, and we've got to, in my view, keep our focus on continued investment in getting to grips with this problem. I accept and I acknowledge that waiting lists are too long in Northern Ireland. It is one of my key priorities to address that problem. Uh, that's why we have been investing the money that we have, the 40 million plus the additional 30 million that will help 150,000 people across Northern Ireland get the tests and the procedures, operations and diagnostics that they, they require. But we need to continue that investment and that's why I'm very pleased that my party leader, the First Minister, has indicated that one of her priorities for the next Assembly term will be prioritising health expenditure and I agree wholeheartedly with her when she says that we need to, yes we need to reform our system, we all know we need to reform our system, but we need to spend a minimum of £1 billion extra on health over the next five years to ensure that we can get to grips with um, waiting lists and also reform our system. The time is up. I call Forgel McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister is right. The lists are too long. In fact, they are the longest in 15 years. And while I welcome funding, individuals who have been on those lists have been on there because the Minister cut the elective care fund uh, to prevent an A&E crisis. So rather than cutting and then throwing money at the crisis that that provokes, can the Minister outline what is his long-term plan to deal with demand? The, the member will I'm sure, reflect on the factual inaccuracy that I cut uh, investment on uh, waiting lists. Um, the reason that um, contracts with the independent sector, the reason that uh, in-house act, uh, activity had to be turned down in recent years came as a direct consequence, Mr Deputy Speaker, of the fact that the executive was losing £200 million, pounds, lost £200 million pounds as a result of welfare reform penalties. Penalties, penalties which his party colleague, the member for, for West Belfast, came into this House. Mr Atwood, the member for West Belfast, came into this House during debates on welfare reform when it was put to them and all of this money was going to be lost. And as a consequence, public services, including health, were going to, going to suffer, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Atwood stood in this House and said that they were a price worth paying. A price worth paying. So more people on waiting lists as a result were, according to the SDLP, a price worth paying for their position on welfare reform. And look, I do accept that they are too long. Uh, that's why we are trying to address them. That's why we have put an additional £40 million pounds in this year to be topped up by a further £30 million additional next year. That will see 150,000 extra people across Northern Ireland get the treatments, get the procedures, get the tests, get the appointments that they have been waiting for. And whilst I hear a lot of criticism coming from the member, coming from the member's party about waiting lists and various other things, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are very silent when it comes to having an alternative plan as to how to take the health service forward. What we are trying to do is reform our system, yes, but we are trying to deal with issues on the front line by investing that additional £70 million. Pounds. And I want to see that investment continue and I want the momentum that we have started to continue on into the next year as well. I call Daki Mackay. I will ask Anne Case to hot question number eight. Mr Deputy Speaker, an integrated perinatal mental health care pathway was published by the Public Health Agency in 2012, and this is being updated at present. This provides regional guidance for all health care professionals who come into contact with pregnant women to ensure that any mental health problems are identified early and women are directed to the appropriate mental health services. For example, midwives can decide on the appropriate care for women who disclose previous mental health problems. The Health and Social Care Board has developed outline proposals for the future development of specialist perinatal mental health services in line with NICE guidance CG192, which was endorsed in Northern Ireland in 2015. These proposals include specialist community-based services and a regional mother and baby unit. The estimated cost of developing these specialist services is £1.9 million. My department's detailed financial planning process for 2016-17 is ongoing and will include consideration of a wide range of developments. The funding requirements for the development of specialist perinatal mental health services will be considered alongside a wide range of competing priorities. The RQIA will be carrying out a review of perinatal mental health services in 2016-17 and the recommendations from that review will inform future development of this service. I call Daki Mackay for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I'm sure the Minister will be well aware of the many horrific stories uh, relating to this particular area of health where mother 
and child are separated, and it's totally un and utterly unacceptable. Uh, and I, I do agree that we need a regional unit, uh, but the sooner the better. So can I ask uh, the Minister, does he agree that moving forward this needs to be an absolute priority for the Department and the new Assembly term? I, 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 I do, and, 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 and I think it's, it's, it's pro probably an area where I think our understanding of the extent of the issue is probably not as, as clear as it maybe is in lots of other areas. And as you, and the member will know from his brief time on the, the committee, there's a huge amount of uh, areas which this department touches upon. And I think this is, I think just as it is with the whole issue of mental health, there's a, not as much of an understanding historically as there, as there ought to have been around, say, our physical health. This is one particular area around perinatal mental health where I think our understanding is getting better. Uh, and we have fallen behind others, and I accept that. Uh, and I think there is an opportunity, and I, and, I, and I welcome and appreciate the work done by, by people like Lindsay Robinson to highlight this issue and the effect that it has on, on real people in Northern Ireland. So it is something that I'm, I'm focused on. There is a review, as I, as I indicated, uh, and I think that there is a demand for a small specialist unit in Northern Ireland to deal with those problems so that the issues that the member raises don't happen again. I think the development of a new regional mother and uh, baby and children's hospital at the Royal Victoria Hospital, which is ongoing in terms of its development, presents the perfect opportunity to make that a reality. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions. And now we move on to topical questions. And I call Bronwyn McGann. Uh, Yogurt, can I ask the Minister when is he likely to make a decision on, on the future of daycare centres such as Rosslea, Dromore uh, and Gorchen, which um, have been proposed for closure? Um, again, a bit like some of the issues that we were discussing earlier on in respect of contingency measures for uh, previous financial years, these are ones that the, the Western Trust have been uh, examining. And, and look, I, I think sometimes there is an instinctive and understandable reaction to decisions to uh, close or downgrade particular services. Uh, and as I mentioned in response to Mr Kennedy earlier, whenever that is done, um, sometimes in the way that they are done, it, without maybe making it clear or just as obvious as to what the, the alternative is going to be, that, that can sometimes cause distress. I don't think it is wrong, however, to, to review provision of any service and see whether that service can be prov provided in a better way with better outcomes for, for people. But the Western Trust submitted a proposal to, for reform to the Health and Social Care Board. That has been forwarded uh, to my department in respect of the, the centres that the, the member name, names. No decisions have been taken, but I can assure the member, and more importantly, I can assure uh, those users of those services that no decision will be taken without the fullest of consideration of the evidence that is placed before me. I call Bronwyn McGann for supplementary. And, and I thank the Minister for his response. And as the Minister would appreciate, at, at the centre of this is a group of older and vulnerable people who are confused and concerned about their future. And can I ask the Minister um, what rural proofing and equality impact assessments have been carried out to date? I, I, I'll come back to the member about specifically what well, I'm, I'm sure that it has been taken into place, and, and, and the fact that it is, a, is dealing with a rural population. I know that one of the um, measures that the Trust was proposing to take place if they were to go through with these closures or, 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 or reconfiguration was to, to pay for the cost of, of, of transporting people to their nearest um, open centre. Um, but I, obviously, your, your member is absolutely right, Deputy Speaker, around how we, the patient has got to be at the centre of everything that we do and that we consider. We are trying to reform our health and social care system in Northern Ireland so that we can produce, not so that we can save money, uh, we have to make our system financially sustainable, we'll absolutely have to do that, but we have to do it on the basis of trying to make outcomes better, outcomes better for patients and people right across our country. Um, and I think we do, particularly then, where we are dealing with vulnerable adults or, or young people, and some of those decisions will have a ramification on them, even if those ramifications are, are on balance positive. I think trusts and others need to be very careful about how they engage. And I think we, have, we need to learn, and indeed we have learned some of the lessons from um, previous consultations where perhaps those sorts of standards weren't adhered to. And I would hope and would trust that the, the Western Trust, in terms of dealing with this issue, and the other trust, um, do bear in mind the need to um, handle things sensitively when they're dealing with vulnerable adults. I call Alistair Patterson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister explain how the £40 million this year and the £30 million for next year compares to how much his department received last year in additional allocations? Well, I can't remember um, precisely what the uh, additional allocations were uh, in the previous year. I'm happy to come back to, to, to the member. Um, the member will, will recall that this year 
Um, our ability to get additional finance was hampered by the fact that there were issues around, around welfare reform, which, in, which meant that there was no June monitoring round and that the October monitoring round was postponed until uh, November then. And my department got close to £50 million pounds in the November monitoring round, um, not all of which went to, but the majority of which went to, to waiting lists. The £30 million pounds that I have announced this week, um, Deputy Speaker, is an allocation from uh, the 16-17 budget, which received a, a significant uplift, uh, an uplift of around £130 million, pounds, uh, the biggest um, and best settlement of any department in, in the entire executive. I call Alistair Patterson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And maybe I can inform the Minister that I am aware that his department received an additional £80 million in the monitoring rounds last year. And yet the situation in my constituency of Fermanagh and South Tyrone continued to deteriorate. Will the minister be in a situation, or when will the minister be in a situation, to get to grips with the current crisis in waiting times? I, I have. I, I, the member will not believe that I was going to say 80 million, but uh, uh, um, I, I, yeah, well, look, I, there, there has been. I, I, without wishing to re-rehearse the arguments that I made to, to members opposite about why we are in the position that we are in, we are in a position uh, because of budgetary pressures and also because of that 14% increase in, in referrals, where we have unacceptably long waiting lists. And you know, I, I think if I was standing here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, before the member before the House, saying that that's just the way it is and we're not doing anything about it, I think the member and, and others would be right and justified in criticising me. We have been trying, once we resolved the issue of welfare reform, we got our budget back onto a stable footing. We have been addressing the problem, and, and I've made it a key priority in terms of the big uh, allocations that I've been making out of the monitoring rounds, out of the uplift that I've received for the, the budget for next year to tackle this particular issue of, of waiting times. Uh, and that, that £70 million pounds that we're investing, which will see 150,000 people, including many in the members' own constituency, and I've had the pleasure of visiting the South Western Acute Hospital, who are doing a, a tremendous job in difficult circumstances to, to eat into these waiting lists. Um, and we are starting to see the benefit of that investment. So the, the quarter, we do the figures and publish them quarter by quarter. Um, and the, but the February, provisional February 2016 figures, Mr Deputy Speaker, are showing an improvement. And that will be reflected in the members' constituency too, where outpatients who are waiting more than 18 weeks, that figure is down by 6%. The number of inpatients who are waiting more than 13 weeks is down by 3.5%, and the number of inpatients waiting more than 26 weeks for an appointment is down by 13%. Um, so that is, that is what the impact of the 40 million, or part of the 40 million, has made over a very short period of time. We're going to see the remainder of that spending, or take, or we're going to spend that right up to the end of this financial year, and then continue that momentum, Deputy Speaker, with the new 30 million that we're investing, which will see those numbers go down. And you know, slowly but surely, we are getting to grips with what is a, a, a problem around waiting lists. I call Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware of the high prevalence of type 2 diabetes in Northern Ireland. So, may I ask, what is the Minister doing to tackle this problem? I thank the, the member for, for a question. That's an area that, that she has a, has a keen interest in. And, and I think we, we're all very used to, to saying things like we have a problem, with, particularly with type 2 diabetes. And whenever I talk about the, the health and social care system needing to, to, to become world class to deal with the challenges that we face, many of those challenges are challenges around a growing number of people in Northern Ireland having uh, long-term conditions and having to live and deal with those long-term conditions. It is frightening in some respects to, to learn, Deputy Speaker, that there are 3,000 new type 2 diabetes cases uh, each and every year in Northern Ireland, um, and, you know, which works down at a, about 10 people a day who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes um, all across our, our country. We are currently in, investing uh, around a million pounds a day in tackling diabetes. Um, but I am pleased that I have been able to uh, make an announcement today. Uh, I was in an event first thing this morning with Diabetes uh, NI, and um, at that event I announced two things. One, uh, the publication for consultation of a new draft diabetes strategic framework, um, and also um, a £1.7 million pounds investment, a million pounds of which comes from the, the new transformation fund I announced last week, to help kickstart some innovative work that will flow from that. Uh, draft um, diabetes strategic framework. That will include investment in, in helping pregnant women who have diabetes to address issues around foot care, to also um, fund some structured diabetes education and also to purchase more insulin pumps. I call Brenda Hale for supplementary. 
I thank the Minister for his answer, and I warmly welcome his announcement for extra money, given that this is his last question time of this mandate. And Minister, while we are speaking about money, um, what are you doing to ensure that additional investment is being directed towards our frontline services, specifically towards staffing costs? There, there, there is a, I think sometimes there is a perception that the investment that we are, certainly if you were listening to some in the media, you would be forgiven for believing that a lot of the investment, the additional investment that we're making is being frittered away on waste and bureaucracy and, and inefficiency. And, and you know, we have increased, and I, I think it's a, um, it's a proud record that we have of increasing investment on, on um, um, day-to-day expenditure on the health service in Northern Ireland from around 4.3 billion at the start of this assembly term up to 4.8 billion at the end of this financial uh, or at the end of this assembly term, and will increase by a further 130 million uh, at the start of the next assembly term. Um, but the, the bulk of that money hasn't gone on administration. It hasn't gone on bureaucracy. It has gone directly into the front line. And the member asked specifically about what we have been doing to um, increase staffing. And I know there are pressures on our staff, and I, um, I acknowledge that. And the um, statement that I made earlier on in respect of the pay award is an acknowledgement of the, uh, the pressures that they are facing, and I'm sure will be warmly welcomed by them. But over the last uh, five years, ministers in my department, including myself, have been investing that money that we have got, that, that additional money that we have been receiving in the front line to increase the number of staff inside our system. So it may surprise many, Mr Deputy Speaker, to learn that the number of nurses, midwives, professional and technical staff, social services staff, medical and dental staff and ambulance staff have gone up by over 2,100 uh, whole time equivalents since the start of this assembly term. And specifically in terms of nurses, there have been 1,191 more nurses, up 9%, 523 more allied health professionals, up 18%, and 275 more consultants, an increase of 21%, Deputy Speaker. So that additional money that we have been getting over this assembly term has been going into the front line, and importantly, it has been employing more doctors, more nurses, and more allied health professionals. I call Claire Subden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, to follow on from my earlier question, um, in a similar vein as using pharmacists, how could the Minister um, utilise the community and voluntary sector to ease uh, pressures in GP or generally across the, the health and social care sector? It's not often that many people get sorry, a, a second supplementary uh, question. Um, I, I have been a, in this job and previous jobs. Um, even as chair of committee in this assembly, being a strong advocate for our, our third sector and an increased role for our third sector in, in assisting the public sector to do its job. And I'm sure the member and the whole House would recognise that there are many areas where, even though we've got this vast uh, welfare state, even though we've got this £5 billion uh, NHS in Northern Ireland employing around 70,000 people, there are still areas where we, we struggle to reach and make an impact, and the community and voluntary sector and charitable sector can help us to do that. Um, I have been, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate and supporter of the ability of that sector to take away some of the. Obviously, they can't do appointments and do some of the work that um, treatments and so forth that the, the GPs can do. But I was, I took, um, I was at, visited the Peninsula Healthy Living in Kirkcobin just the other day to launch a, a new um, uh, innovation scheme for the third sector in Northern Ireland, uh, and that will be open for. It's out to consultation at the minute, hopefully out uh, for, for bids later on in this financial year. And that will allow community and voluntary sector organisations to bid in for innovative schemes that are going to produce better health outcomes. And it might be in, in, in their own particular local community, or it might be right across the whole of Northern Ireland. It will be particularly focused on collaboration, on early intervention and prevention, and innovation more generally. So that is a practical way in which we are trying to help that sector to do more um, and to do what they do very well, which is to, to deal with particular problems in, in local communities in a way that the system sometimes struggles to do. I call Claire Sutton for supplement. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd be quite keen to see the community and voluntary sector work within, the dom within domiciliary care, particularly in rural areas, so that they can reach those people who, you know, who seem to be able to slip through the net. Um, how is he encouraging maybe investment or funding in this area so that um, we can invest more services in rural areas, uh, particularly for domiciliary care? On, on domiciliary care, the, there are some community and voluntary sector, third sector organisations or social enterprises who are operating in that space in terms of dom domiciliary care. And the member is, is right that sometimes those are in, in areas of, of Northern Ireland which are perhaps not as attractive to, to others to, 
um, to work and operate in. Um, and we have, as a member will recall, invested an additional £1.6 million pounds in the domiciliary and residential care sector, nursing care sector, uh, in what remains of this financial year. It won't solve all of the problems that that sector faces. Um, um, but we are at least uh, putting a boost and a help in there to deal with some of the problems that have appeared in, in different parts of our country. Uh, and I'm happy to work with the third sector and others on, on innovative ideas. I think there are very good models and interesting models from around the globe of um, where, the social, where social enterprises, the third sector, and indeed others, have been able to step in and, on a sustainable basis, deal with some of the issues and, and problems that we are facing with domiciliary care in Northern Ireland. And that is the end of our period of time for topical questions and could I ask members to take their ease for a few moments.